and welcome back to Friday Reads, where we help you find your next read. I'm Jill. And I'm Julie, and we're continuing our journey across the United States. This week we are in states that are in the Great Plains. So Jill, what's your first pick for a book taking place in the Great Plains? This is Hourglass by Michelle Rene, <clears throat> set in the lawless town of Deadwood, South Dakota. Hourglass shares an intimate look at the woman behind the legend of Calamity Jane, told through the eyes of 12-year-old Jimmy Glass. After their pa falls deathly ill with smallpox, Jimmy and his sister, Hour, travel into Deadwood to seek help. While their pa is in quarantine, the two form unbreakable bonds with the surrogate family that emerges from the tragedy of loss. In a place where life is fragile and families are ripped apart by disease, death, and desperation, a surprising collection of Deadwood's inhabitants surround Jimmy, Hour, and Jane. There, in the most unexpected of places, they find family protecting them from the uncertainty and chaos that surrounds them all. So... Deadwood South Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> My first pick is Stripped Bear by Shannon Baker. This was published in 2016, and this takes place in Nebraska. Kate Fox is living the dream. She is married to Grand County Sheriff Ted Connor, the heir to her beloved Nebraska Sandhills cattle ranch, where they live with Kate's orphan teenage niece, Carly. With the support of the well-connected Fox clan, which includes Kate's eight boisterous and interfering siblings, Ted's re-election as Grand County Sheriff is virtually assured. That leaves Kate to the solitude and satisfaction of Frog Creek, her own little slice of heaven. One night, Kate answers a shattering phone call from Roxy. She's the owner of the Bar J. Carly's granddad, Eldon, owner of the ranch, is dead, and Ted has been shot and may never walk again. Kate bows to find the killer. She soon discovers Ted responded so quickly to the scene because he was already at the bar. And a little bit of suspense related to that, which I'm not going to give you as a spoiler. And to her woes, Carly, the niece, has gone missing. So, all sorts of things are happening. Kate finds out that Eldon was considering selling his ranch to an obscenely rich environmentalist. Some in town hate the idea of an outsider buying up that land. Others are desperate to sell. And some might kill to get their way. As she becomes a victim of several accidents, Kate knows she must find the killer before it's too late. Mm -hmm. So this one has some twists and turns in it. Stripped Bear by Shannon Baker. <clears throat> So my next one is by an author that you might be familiar with, Lu Louise Erdick. She writes a lot of Native American kind of stories. She wrote The Roundhouse. This is one that takes place in North Dakota called The Plague of Doves. The unsolved murder of a, on a, of a family farm of a farm family still haunts the white small town of Pluto, North Dakota. Generations after the vengeance exacted and distortions of the facts transformed the lives of Ojibwe living in the nearby reservation. Part Ojibwe, part white, Evelina Harp is an ambitious young girl prone to falling hopelessly in love. Musham, Evelina's grandfather, is a repository of family and tribal history with an all too intimate knowledge of the violent past. And Judge Anton Bezo Kutz, who bears witness, understands the weight of historical injustice better than anyone. Through the distinct and winning voices of three unforgettable narrators, the collective stories of two interwoven communities ultimately come to rev together to reveal a final wrenching truth. So, hmm. Plague of Doves. My second pick <clears throat> is Great Plains by Ian Fraser. This was published back in 1989. He's an award-winning columnist for The New Yorker, and <clears throat> Frazier spent much of the 1980s alone driving and exploring the quiet, flat roads of America's prairie heartland, from North Dakota to Texas and back again, frequenting dozens of tiny hamlets along the way, some more dead than alive. Telling countless stories of the former and current residents of this historically rich region, he never hesitates to strike up a conversation with strangers or stop the car and poke around an apparently abandoned homestead. While he includes much about famous individuals like Lewis and Clark or Bonnie and Clyde, he devotes many pages to people you may not have heard of, reveling in the historical minutia he encounters along the way. He doesn't pass by a local museum or historic site without stopping and, play and paying an in-depth visit. The smaller the town, the quieter the cafe, the more likely he is to stop and chat with the locals. He displays an avid enthusiasm for Native American history. He writes about dozens of different tribes. He has a lengthy interlude about Crazy Horse, the great Sioux leader. But the highlight of this book is his effort to find the site of Sitting Bull's cabin on the Grand River in South Dakota. 
Assisted by a local hitchhiker named Jim Yellow Earring, he drives his ever-suffering automobile down a mercilessly rutted trail to the river's edge where he finds the requisite obelisk and historical plaque, overgrown with tall grasses and guarded by a rattlesnake. Ooh. So it was described as a hilarious and fascinating look at the great middle of our nation where most travelers fly over the Great Plains. This wide-eyed wanderer dives in. <laughs> so <laughs> check out Great Plains by Ian Frazier. Yeah, don't fly over. Go visit them <laughs> and see what they're like. So this one's kind of different. This book was published in 1932 to begin with. It's called Black, Black Elk Speaks, being the life story of a holy man of the Ogul... Aglala Sioux. <clears throat> it's translated by John G. Nearhart, um, and it's about this Black Elk guy. Black Elk Speaks is the story of the Oglala Lakota visionary and healer Nicholas Black Elk, who lived between 1863 and 1950, and his people during the momentous twilight years <clears throat> of the 19th century. It offers readers much more than a precious glimpse of vanished time. Black Elk's searing visions of the unity of humanity and earth, conveyed by John Nearhart, have made this book a classic that crosses multiple genres. Whether appreciated as a poignant tale of Lakota life, as a history of a native nation, or an enduring spiritual testament, Black Elk Speaks is an unforgettable. Black Elk met the extinguished poet, writer, and critic John G. Nehart in 1930 on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota and asked Nehart to share his story with the world. Nehart understood and conveyed Black Elk's experiences in this powerful and inspirational message to all humankind. So if you want to hear about this interview, it's nonfiction, you know, about this Native American Black Elk dude. <laughs> Sounds interesting. Yeah. And Black Elk Speaks. Black Elk Speaks. I'm going way back in time, too. My next <laughs> pick is Oak Pioneers by Willa Cather. This was published in 1913. <laughs> this was her first great novel, and to many it remains her unchallenged masterpiece. No other work of fiction so faithfully conveys both the sharp physical realities and the mythic sweep of the transformation of the American frontier and the transformation of the people who settled there. Cather's heroine is Alexandra Bergson, who arrives on the wind-blasted prairie of Hanover, Nebraska as a girl and grows up to make it a prosperous farm. But the success story is darkened by loss, and Alexandra's devotion to the land may come at the cost of love itself. At once a sophisticated, pastoral, and prototype for later feminist novels, O Pioneers is a work in which triumph and is inextricably enmeshed with tragedy, a story of people who do not claim a land so much as they submit to it, and in the process become greater than they were. So if you're interested in Willa Cather, I know one of the ladies in my short story group loves her. So O Pioneers by Willa Cather. So I'm leaving the Dakotas and going down to Oklahoma. The Long and Far Away Gone by Lou Burney. In the summer of 1986, two tragedies rocked Oklahoma City. Six movie theater employees were killed in an armed robbery, while one inexplicably survived. Then, a teenage girl vanished from the annual state fair, and neither crime was ever solved. 25 years later, the vibrations of these unsolved cases quietly echo through the survivors' lives. A private investigator in Vegas, Wyatt's latest inquiry takes him back to the past as he's tried to escape and drags him deeper into the harrowing mystery of the movie house robbery that left six of his friends dead. Like Wyatt, Juliana struggles with the past but the day her beautiful older sister Genevieve disappeared. When Juliana discovers that one of the original suspects has resurfaced, she'll stop at nothing to find answers. As fate brings these damaged souls together, their obsessive quest sparks sexual currents neither can resist, huh? but what, will their shared passion and obsession heal them or push them closer to the edge? Even if they find the truth, will it help them understand what happened that day far away, long gone summer? <clears throat> will it set them free or destroy them? So. The long and far away gone. <clears throat> Our next pick comes from the nonfiction collection, and this is The Worst Hard Time, The Untold Story of Those Who Survived the Great American Dust Bowl by Timothy Egan. This was published in 2005. The dust storms that terrorized the high plains in the darkest years of the Depression were like nothing ever seen before or since. And I know we've had books before about the Dust Bowl. Mm -hmm. This author's critically acclaimed account rescues this iconic chapter of American history from the shadows in a tour de force of historical reporting. Following a dozen families and their communities through the rise and fall of the region, 
Egan tells of their desperate attempts to continue through blinding black dust blizzards, crop failures, and the death of their loved ones. Brilliantly capturing the terrifying drama of catastrophe, Egan does equal justice to the human characters who became his heroes. The New York Times described them as the stoic, long-suffering men and women whose lives he opens up with urgency and respect. So if you're interested in a book about the Dust Bowl and those who survived, check out The Worst Hard Time. The Dust Bowl is like really fascinating me too. to me. So. Me too. And I know we've done books. We've both done books about uh-huh, that before. It's so good. It's <laughs> like, it's such a weird time. Okay. So my next one, you might know this author too. Rainbow Roll, I guess. She she must be from Nebraska because oh. she has, all, all her books are like based there. <laughs> this is the adult novel Landline, um, which actually won the Goodreads Choice Award for winner of Best Fiction in 2014, which you wouldn't know by the Goodreads ratings on this <laughs> one, but it is actually, I read this one, it's good. Georgie McCool knows her marriage is in trouble. It has been in trouble for a long time. She still loves her husband, Neil, and Neil loves her deeply, and that almost seems besides the point now. Maybe it was always besides the point. Two days before they're supposed to visit Neil's fam- family in Omaha for Christmas, Georgie tells Neil that she can't go. She's a TV writer and something's come up on her show. She has to stay in Los Angeles. She knows that Neil will be upset with her. Neil is always a little upset with Georgie, but she doesn't expect him to pack up the kids and go home without her. When her husband and kids leave for the airport, Georgie wonders if she's finally done it, if she's finally ruined everything. That night, Georgie discovers a way to communicate with Neil in the past. It's not time travel, not exactly, but she feels like she's been given an opportunity to fix her marriage before it starts. (laughs) Is that what she's supposed to do? Or would Georgie and Neil be better off if their marriage never happened? So, yeah, so there's a little bit of a time travel without time travel. Like, (laughs) it's through a phone call. A little spoiler there. (laughs) (laughs) My last pick also comes from nonfiction, and this is Stringing Rosaries, The History, the Unforgivable, and the Healing of Northern Plains American Indian Boarding School Survivors. It's quite a mouthful for the Ooh. title. By Denise Laji Modir, published in 2019. <clears throat> The author's interest in American Indian boarding school survivor stories evolved from recording her father and other family members speaking of their experiences. Her research helped her to gain insight, a deeper understanding of her parents, and how and why she and her siblings were parented in the way they were. That insight led her to an emotional ceremony of forgiveness described in the last chapter of Stringing Rosaries. The journey to record survivors' stories led her through the Dakotas and into Minnesota and into the personal and private space of boarding school survivors. While there, she heard stories and they had never shared before. She came to an understanding of new terms, historical and intergenerational trauma and soul wounds. This book provides a brief history of the boarding school programs for Indigenous Americans, followed by interviews with boarding school survivors and ending with the author's own healing journey with her father. It's also filled with a lot of um, black and white photographs as you go through, too, from that time. There's wonderful photographs in here. So if you're interested in this, this sounded like an interesting book to me. Check out Stringing Rosaries, published from back in 2019. That's an interesting part of history, too, Mm -hmm. those boarding schools. Well, we hope that you have some good ideas if you want to take a stop in the Great Plains instead of flying over. Yeah, dive in, (laughs) like our author did. You know, you can find our videos on our Facebook page and on the Kimberly Public Library website. We thank you for watching. We'd like you to comment, share, let us know what you're reading this fall. And until next time, bye-bye. Bye.